Hello, thank you very much for coming and making your way through post-apocalyptic Cannes um, to be here. And congratulations to Read Me Then for getting this um, alternative venue sorted out so quickly. Um, I'm very delighted today to introduce a very distinguished panel who are going to be talking about maximizing digital opportunities. Um, we have on the far right, we have Richard Goldsmith, who is EVP of Global uh, Distribution for the Jim Henson Company. Um, in the middle, we have uh, Guilherme Coelho, who's CEO of Zero One Digital out of Brazil. And on my right, uh, Paul Nunn, who's Managing Director of Outfit 7 uh, from the UK. And we're going to start the session with, um, with, a, with a presentation from uh, Richard, who is going to talk a little bit about, uh, about the Jim Henson Company's experience with, uh, with, uh, and its digital journey. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Miles. And welcome, everybody, this morning. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Presentation, please, yes. So, <laughs> I, the Jim Henson Company has been making filmed entertainment for 60 years. Uh, many of you know us uh, as a producer of family entertainment. Um, I thought it would be interesting today to just start with an overview about how we manage our digital assets. Um, what our digital strategy is in general for both the media side of our business um, which is the filmed and entertainment side, um, as well as the digital publishing side of our business. So our filmed entertainment <clears throat> operations uh, consist really of three different categories of content as it applies to television. You know, we also make feature films, but this presentation is devoted solely to our television content. Um, we have current series on the air, and we have new series that are about to go on the air that we group into bucket one. Secondly, we have a large library of series um, that span more than 35 years uh, in our library um, that we still distribute uh, uh, actively. Um, and third, original series that we produce for digital platforms. We also have our own channel, Jim Henson Family TV, which is both a YouTube channel um, and an OTT um, that was established two and a half years ago. And so part of our thinking for whatever our strategies we have is how we integrate content into our own channel. Our goals really are what we call windowing. Um, that is, you know, basically the theme of what you will see in a lot of this presentation. Um, the purpose of windowing is, first of all, to maximize revenues, and secondly, to maximize brand awareness. Um, given that much of our content is for families, we have two purposes, to entertain uh, and expose our brands and also to monetize them, and a lot of the monetization comes through consumer products. So. As we're doing deals, we're looking not just at the revenue, but also about how much audience that we're reaching, not just through one platform, but through multiple platforms that we are selling to. The challenges of windowing are many. Uh, you know, everybody that we speak with, all of our clients want multiple rights. Uh, they want everything. Usually they want it for not a lot of money. Um, exclusivity. Um, limiting what we do on other platforms. So every day uh, our life gets more challenging uh, in negotiating these rights um, with every platform. Uh, this is a look at our current series. Uh, Dinosaur Train uh, is um, our most established series in nearly 200 countries. Um, it is uh, our, our biggest hit currently from a consumer product standpoint. Uh, Doozer's uh, right behind it. A new series premiered last year. Um, just announced a new master toy deal for both of these. Um, Sid the Science Kid, a uh, uh, classic series on eight years uh, around the world, Pajanimals and Hyopi. And then we also distribute third-party content through Henson Independent Properties, which we call HIP, and uh, that includes Driftwood Bay and Elias. Our new TV series coming on in 2016 includes Splash. This is our new PBS series uh, in the United States, Big Order, 80 episodes. Uh, Dot, 
Uh, Dot is based on the book by Randy Zuckerberg, uh, one of the co-founders of Facebook. It's about kids and technology. Splash is um, about the oceans. It's a great comedy. Um, and Word Party. Uh, Word Party is um, for the youngest viewers on Netflix, um, and it teaches kids all the word words that they need to know to start school. When we are taking out these new traditional TV series, uh, still to this day, our biggest business and the biggest reach that we have is television. Um, I always say that every interview and every panel I'm, I'm on, people try to get me to say television's dead. Well, television is far from dead. It's only gotten bigger because it's now 24 seven. Um, so our general strategy um, in every market that we go in is to make a television deal. And oftentimes we make two deals. We make a broadcast deal and then there might be a window a year later for a cable deal. Then we're able to do a home entertainment deal, which is what we refer to as transactional. That's where people pay to watch your content. Um, and that is uh, DVD um, and EST, which is um, electronic sell-through. Uh, that's what you get, for example, on iTunes, um, or ERT, which is rental, um, or TVOD, that's watching on demand on, on some sort of a service, mainly a cable service. Um, there's usually a window. That window could be three months to a year after it goes on television. But then again, very important for us because when you're establishing a brand, you want to be at multiple points at retail. This is how you do that. Um, then uh, subscription video on demand. Those are the services like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu. Um, we would have a window there. Um, and uh, what, what's left uh, will go on our Jim Henson Family TV channel. Um, normally for a show like this, it would be a limited number of episodes for promotion and lots of clips. All of which would be designed to steer our fans to these platforms. Our library series, uh, as I mentioned before, go back over 30 years, uh, Fraggle Rock uh, being uh, the most prolific. Um, they still do very, very well on demand, given that they're Henson shows, they look very different uh, than other series, you know, just traditional animation series, and incredibly high quality. So it's still a significant business for us, but a different strategy. Um, you know, as the library gets older, it's more challenging to sell to traditional television. So we do still have traditional television deals. Um, so for example, now we just sold Fraggle Rock in the US to a network because for the first time in over 30 years, it's being digitally remastered and for the first time in HD. So we do a lot to try to get on television, but the reality is, is that there's still a business in home entertainment, there's still a business in, in digital, and also for our channel. So in every market, our first goal is to monetize through home entertainment, television, and digital. And where we can't monetize, that content goes on our own channel so that through subscription and through ad revenue, we are able to monetize it and keep those shows um, out in the public. We also produce original digital series. Um, our, you know, we've been doing this for really long time. Uh, Possibility Shop, which we produced for Disney. Um, Wilson and Ditch for PBS. Um, we produced Doozers, which was Hulu's first um, original series for kids. Uh, just produced a pilot, Lily, our second pilot actually, Lily the Unicorn for Amazon. Um, and really proud to produce Word Party, which is premiering next year on Netflix for their youngest viewers, which we talked about before. Um, so this, to us, is just an extension of what we're doing for television. We really look at these digital platforms as just being television. They're just a different kind of delivery. In some cases, they're lower budget series, like Wilson and & Ditch and Possibility Shop, these three series are as expensive or more expensive than traditional television. This is a little clip of Doozers. Let's create design and make 
So I think Doozers is an excellent example of how content for a digital channel like Hulu is no different than television. And in fact, that series airs on TV networks as well around the world. Um, our digital strategy is a little different. The first client is not television. It's either um, an ad-supported or subscription online platform like Hulu or Amazon or Netflix or YouTube. Um, but then the strategy becomes basically the same. You want to be in home entertainment, you want to try to be on traditional television at some point, um, and then we want to have content on our own channel that are driving viewers promotionally to these big platforms. Um, in digital publishing, this is the second side of our business, um, we are a prolific uh, producer of apps and web content and ebooks. Uh, they're best selling. They, in the iTunes store, they've won you know, dozens and dozens of awards. They offer kids the complete second screen experience that they expect. They can access generally this content anywhere, wherever they are, on any device. Um, again, like our media strategy, it builds awareness and it also um, is a profit center. Um, this is an example of some of our online content. Every time we make a show, we produce uh, robust online content, mainly games that go to our partners around the world, um, lots of apps um, and eBooks. So every single brand that we do comes with this and also some of the brands that we've done, like Word Party, um, which we're producing for Netflix, start as an app. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, uh, it's going to be very interesting, I think, to contrast uh, the story of a of a very well established and sixty year old company with some of the uh, some of our uh, our more recent uh, friends. And I'm going to start with um, with Paul. And could you um, talk a little bit about uh, about Outfit Seven? And also, uh, I think I believe you have a clip. So should we start by showing the, um, showing yeah. the video? Yeah, yeah, great. If we could show the Outfit Seven clip, thank you. Are you ready? One, two, three, four! Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, so uh, Outfit7, as, as you've uh, kind of seen there, started life as the app developer at least uh, Talking Tom, so my Talking Tom, uh, the latest incumbent of that. Um, we have a very large uh, mobile app platform that has led to us uh, kind of becoming an entertainment brand, I would say. So uh, the reason I'm here and the reason I have, a, as you said, kind of the opposite perspective is because we had the app platform and we've kind of negotiated our way through to content um, right up to the point now where we make um, what we would consider to be um, the, the height of kids animation and family and animation content which is a full CGI HD uh, 52 by 11 uh, animated series which which we're now negotiating back towards the the kind of waterfall that you have of, of different windowing strategies and we've uh, up to now had the flexibility and the freedom to, to not have to worry about words like windowing uh, because we own all of our content and we produce it and we distribute it globally ourselves. So uh, I suppose that's the intro of who we are. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. And uh, Guillermo, could you also um, uh, introduce yourself and who you are? Would you like to show your clip? And uh, uh, Actually, my clip is after the presentation. I think okay. I'll start with the presentation, Perfect, which, yes. which will help me. So uh, first of all, thank you uh, for all for being here today. today. 
and thank you for MIP Junior to inviting me. Um, so I'll start with the presentation here, and we'll talk a little bit about Zero or Zero One Digital. So, um, but I'll start saying by 2020 we should have everyone uh, with a pocket supercomputer. Uh, we are just in the middle of the road, just to show the potential on the next five years, uh, probably uh, every people on earth will have one smartphone where we get there, where it's equal, and, and that's double this, the, the quantity of smartphones that we have today. So we have double the market that we just built uh, now. Um, people check their smartphone 150 times a day. That's what you do, that's what we do. We don't notice that, but that's how savvy we are for using uh, these mobile devices, smartphones and, and tablets. Uh, and out of these uh, people, 87, um, all the pe people that use smartphones, 87% prefer apps instead of mobile sites. Uh, since you have to check it so many times during the day, you know that apps work much uh, more uh, faster and uh, linear uh, way on, on smartphone than, than mobile sites. Uh, and the problems uh, begin, right? 24% of apps are just used once, and within three months, 75% of users um, is gone. Uh, nobody uses your, your application anymore. So we have the mo mobile fragmentation. Um, when we started in 2009 with applications, it was just the App Store on Apple. Uh, we have now five years, six years later now. We have multiple platforms. We have dozens of app stores. We have hundreds of networks. We have thousands of analytics and a million new tools uh, to be used, which were not used before on websites or things like this are specifically for, for the application world. And that's where we come in. That's where uh, our company works is in the app publishing um, um, field. We create, distribute, not just development of the application, but we distribute also and scale mobile business. Uh, on the creation, we have all the, the creative concept, usability, information, and programming, and all the stuff to, to put the, the application together. On the distribution um, part, that's where we put all uh, the applications on multiple stores. There are many, many different stores today in the world, not only the app stores that we know, like Google Play, or, uh, or Apple iTunes, or Amazon, where is the transactional mode. There are many other stores called um, subscription stores for apps, like we had TVOD and SVOD, now we had T apps and S apps also, right? Which is the subscription apps. You can subscribe for a plan on your carrier, on your mobile carrier, and then you pay a monthly fee, and then you can use like 500 or 1,000 uh, premium apps that they choose to be inside of the club. This is a model that is spreading very fast in Latin America and some other countries, because it's very easy to get the, the user paying, because it's just to say yes to an SMS, and then they are into the club, right? Because they are built uh, through the carrier, and then they have all those premium apps to, to be used. And then on the last part, on the scale part, um, it's, it's just not a matter of putting the application on the store. You have to, to know how to scale it, right? So you have to do the app store optimization. It's very important, description, keywords, and the name, even the icon that you use on your, on your uh, application, it, it might change the results that, that you have, the color of your icon or the border that you put in your icon. Um, uh, we do analytics, you have to do the data-driven marketing, you do user acquisition, which is buy installs, you have campaigns on, uh, you can buy installs on Facebook, Twitter, AdWords, so each install could cost up to, or, or more than five dollars uh, for each install that, that, that you get, for example, in the United States, so it's not um, uh, a cheap thing, but it's important thing for you to, to do growth hacking, for example, for you to go up on top rankings of your categories, and we do A-B testing and all the engagement and retention. So some of our apps, uh, you, saw, you saw that 75% that of people are gone after three months. Some of the apps that we have for children, for kids, for content, uh, uh, with kids content, we have retention of up to 20, 25% of people after one year, right? So that's tough to, to get. So this is our flagship. This is our most uh, known, well-known application that we have. It's the Galinha Pintadinha, or Lotti Dotti Chicken. And it's a very well-known character that started in Brazil, and now it's taking over the world. It's, number, uh, uh, it's, it's impressive that 
even without being on television, it's just digitally started on, on YouTube and applications and VOD. Um, it became the number uh, 89, top 89 brand in the world. It was just in the, the licensing expo on, on Las Vegas. Uh, this is another brand that we do application, which is Patati Patata. Uh, and these are some of the most well-known brands in, in, in Brazil that, that we do. And most of them are having now uh, content, not only in Portuguese, but they are doing content in Spanish and in English also. And the app platform is perfect for that because instantly we can publish the content worldwide, right? This is another content that we do, MIP Baby, uh, Descobriendo, which is from Argentina. Uh, and Cookie and Friends, which is our first title with content from Oxford University Publishing, which we are mixing a little bit of entertainment and uh, education of language learning. So it's an entertainment application that we are releasing with content of Oxford now. Um, so I'll play the video so you can take a look at a little bit quicker uh, on the applications that, that we built. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I'd like to start by asking the panel a little bit about um, about transformational moments in your in your companies. Where, uh, for example, with Henson, you were it was originally a puppet uh, a puppet company, and then um, and then presumably everyone sat around and said we've got to become a digital company. And uh, I'm going to ask all panelists about about moments where uh, their businesses have pivoted or, or, or taken a new direction or taken a great big leap forward. And perhaps if I could start, uh, Richard, uh, with sure. you. Sure. Um, I would say that there's two transformational moments in my life uh, at the Jim Henson Company. Um, the first one uh, regarding our productions was before I joined the company. Ten years ago, uh, uh, our company was thinking, you know, we have a long tradition in puppetry. Um, that's how the company started. That's our legacy. Um, the family and, and the company were thinking about where is puppetry going, um, and they invented a system called Henson uh, Digital Puppetry, um, which now is part of our creature shop and we refer to um, as digital puppetry. Um, we produce a number of series uh, now, Sid the Science Kid, um, our new series uh, Word Party for Netflix, um, our new series Splash for PBS, and what it does is it, can tr it combines traditional animation um, but all the characters are puppeteered live. All the voices are done live. Uh, all of the acting is done live with, with puppeteers. It's an amazing process um, if, if you've ever seen it. Um, so that was one on the production side. On the distribution side, uh, a couple years ago, uh, when uh, we launched um, our Jim Henson Family TV, um, and it was on platforms like Hulu um, and on its own as an OTT. And I could go home and boot up my television and sit in my living room and watch all of our series on demand. Uh, that, for me, was an incredible moment. And it was really just the beginning of uh, where a producer like us can self-distribute um, their content around the world. Brilliant, thank you. Paul, could you talk about um, the started off as a single app, presumably? Yeah, so I, I suppose um, being an app developer, we have uh, really easy junctures because we release apps. So when an app is released, it kind of all the numbers go up, or well, hopefully they go up, or uh, it just depends how far they go up, I suppose, in our current situation. I suppose the transformational moment 
um, fr from my perspective, a, r a very big one in context of this discussion would be when we noticed that our YouTube um, uh, our YouTube character base was growing without us doing anything. So users were, uh, around the time of Talking Tom 2, we'd created an application which allowed content creation by users. Uh, and we saw this en masse. So as our distribution increased, we saw that our YouTube uh, kind of views were increasing. Uh, all we did to start with to make to make channels and house that that content, um, but the big change became uh, with our platform relationship with Google came when we decided to start testing our own content, uh, and that kind of in from one day to the next opened up a whole new world for Outfit Seven of content creation because it allowed us to do two things. One was to satisfy fans who were calling out for our characters to in interact more. And it also gave us a vehicle that wasn't an app which takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to produce. And a lot of, uh, just generally a, a ton of our, our business it was going into forming apps that take a long time. So to be able to create something and upload it the next day, uh, to get feedback immediately off the off from the platform and from users and to iterate it allowed us to advance our YouTube strategy very rapidly from there. And by default, our content strategy. So we, we made the decision to, com uh, to commission our animated series, uh, which is a big investment from our side, and right at the top of the, the resources that are needed for content. We did that really quickly because we immediately got feedback very quickly from a very simple thing, which was you, we followed users to, to, to their content. Fantastic. When did you? When was that moment? When, how long ago was that moment that the sort of, sort of YouTube popped up on your radar and you thought, "Oh, blimey, we better take this seriously." Yeah. So that that moment is is a very big, um, I suppose, a very big couple of months in the, in the life of of Outfit Seven was uh, towards uh, it was towards the end of two thousand and twelve. Uh, when we released My Talking Tom and we also uh, formed a really strong YouTube strategy which had Tom having his own YouTube channel where we started to create elements which, which were 50% uh, content, 50% marketing. You know, hedge our bets a little. Uh, we must, I think some of these digital platforms and, and, and ourselves included must be the only places where marketing earns its money back in, in a month and then <laughs> to, it keeps on paying you forever and ever. Uh, and that's kind of, in a nutshell, where the digital strategy lies for us. It's, it's really low risk, it's very high reward, quick feedback. Uh, but that definitely was the period, the release of, uh, of, of My Talking Tom yeah. and, and towards that period was very strong. Sure, and so now the YouTube, the YouTube stats are pretty impressive, huh? Yeah, so we... Um, we currently have around about five, uh, five million subscribers for our channels uh, in that short space of time we've developed that. We, because of the relationship between our apps and, and our content in the, in the ecosystem of mobile, which is one of my biggest tips for, um, for digital revenue maximization, is just to view it as an ecosystem and not individual parts. We, we really don't do that. Our, our apps link out to you or link, draw YouTube in, video content uh, is very close to our apps and users really can navigate around it quite freely. That means that we've been able to rapidly advance. I think we add uh, subscribers at a rate of around 300 to 400,000 per month at the moment, um, just by testament of that. So we're growing very rapidly. But the, view, the views are astronomically big because we're uh, our mobile app platform Billions is 250 presumably. million users per month. So that means that the views organically that come from that, even if we just looked at those, are millions. But I think it's around about 220 million views per per month now on YouTube. And, and your revenue model is basically, it's advertising, it's um, so very, not, not, much, not much in-app purchase. Not it, there, there is a great volume of in-app purchase, okay, but yeah. it is kind of, we, yeah, we, 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 I, I think if you look at apps, um, and maybe you'll agree, you kind of see one end of the market or the other. You see the, the traditionally the more Google side, which is revenues are driven by um, uh, advertising and it's, it's to a certain extent in-app purchase. And then the other side you have kind of more towards the Apple end, which is, um, much more likely to be paid apps or have subscription models built in. The, the lines are completely blurred now, but we certainly started with, um, so our, uh, Sam O'Loggin, who's our CEO, has from the start said that our business is 50% making great products, and, and in that case, apps at the time, and 50% distribution. And our simple aim has always been to get the most eyeballs on the content that we create that we possibly can. And that aim remains today. And in our discussions with content uh, platforms and with platforms in general, it's always, that's always the key for us. And um, is most of your content based around the Talking Tom character? Do you have other, other properties and channels? Yeah, so there's a, there's a talk, Talking Tom and Friends is kind of the umbrella group. That franchise is for, for certain is our main focus. We have uh, other apps and other interests, but that is really uh, for the purposes of our, our largest opportunities, for the purposes of our largest investments, that's, that's where we're at, yeah. And, um, and, uh, and you presumably have the same battle to... Uh, keep your uh, keep your apps relevant uh, and alive on people's yeah. devices. It's something where content has really added for us. 
So uh, first of all, we're not a game, so we don't have to worry about people exhausting the levels quickly. So the actual structure of our apps, the life cycle of our apps is a lot different to to many other, uh, I suppose we would be classed kind of a game developer, but we're not, we don't suffer the same as, as, as Rovio and those other guys on some of those elements. Um, we're more characters, you know. Uh, the, the entertainment part of our apps is, is the biggest. We're in entertainment apps. Um, the family entertainment, we don't want, kids don't want to have their parents remove Talking Tom from the phone, and that gives us really good retention by default. Uh, but content allows us to really add value to the app. So instead of having all the pressure on us to come up with new, I don't know, new, new furniture, new clothes, new costumes. We also can supplement in new mini games is one part, but also new content. So uh, Tom, Tom's in bed and he dreams a new episode every couple of weeks and, and fans have something new to interact with in the same app. So our, our app becomes kind of a vehicle for the content. And that's yeah. very strong. And so how many apps have you uh, released? There's a 15, I think, now, around okay. about that. We've, yeah. we, a couple have uh, trailed off and we pick up new ones, but around about 15 at Fantastic. Anytime. And Guillermo, uh, uh, from what I'm understanding, slightly the other end of the, of the so more on, on the Apple side with, trans, with in-app purchases and working in a slightly different way. Yeah, that's right. But what he said, it's true. We are always trying to find the best ways to, to monetize, and advertising is one of them, and transactional, it's another one. Uh, the transactional one, I would say, uh, would be the, more, the, the purest one, or the pure one, which the... the, the the, the consumer wants to get that thing and pays for it, right? And the other one, um, you have to place the advertising there. And uh, we are dealing with many changes right now. So for example, we, we wanted our apps to go into Google Family. What did we have to do? Take the advertising out. So we, from, from one day to the other one, we had to take all the, the but it, it was a choice, right? So we would see what would happen on the transactional side because we would be more promoted. Uh, through the family uh, categories and things like this. So we are constantly trying and seeking, and it's, sometimes it's not just our choice, right? The platforms, they do these changes, and we have to do our choice to see uh, if we want to go more for transactional or for more, uh, uh, more for advertising. But um, we saw the, the, the change for our business because we are in the digital business since 1996. But in 2009, 2010, that's when we, we saw the app revolution coming. We started playing with those little pieces of software on, on mobile phones, and we were just fascinated with that. And that was one moment which I think that changed our business. And the second, uh, and, and you could see you could monetize on that. <laughs> and, and the second thing was the digital video uh, grown up, right? Because uh, I, I've been working with digital video since like Windows 160, 120, like, you know, uh, pixels from 1995 to do, 1994 to do CD-ROMs. And um, in 2009, 2010, and with the services like YouTube and the new VOD services, that's when the new, the, the, the real video, the real online video came. And that's because of broadband connections that started to get much better on every country. The devices uh, that we have today, smartphones and tablets are everywhere and they're all connected. So uh, that's the, 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 the main reason. And that's why today we live the, the real digital era, right? And so I think 2009, 2010, that's when it, it changed. Really. Fantastic. And we had, I was, I was um, uh, on a panel yesterday and we had an interesting discussion about marketing for kids and uh, marketing to kids. And, uh, and to what extent do you, do you guys have to balance um, between the parents being the customers for, your, for the apps and paying for them uh, and, uh, and the kids being the users, uh, kids being the users of them? Um, it's, 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 I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure this comes up at Henson a lot um, about... Uh, uh, because the brand, the, the brand values that Henson uh, represents are very, are very, it feels like a very safe brand for parents. But um, but you've still got to market your products to uh, to kids and families. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's uh, it's of absolute paramount importance for us uh, that uh, that the kids are safe. Um, and as an example, um, our YouTube channel for many years had. Uh, no search capability. In other words, that there was no recommended videos. We had hardly any audience because at the time, before YouTube had its kids app, which is amazing, um, they couldn't control the uh, the videos that we were, you know, that were being recommended to our kids, um, nor the advertising. So, uh, unlike all of our competitors, we decided to just shut it off. Um, so we are, uh, you know, very concerned. Um, always um, about 
advertising um, and also about in-app purchases and otherwise. And uh, we spend a lot of time uh, talking about it and thinking about how properly to manage it. And it's, uh, it is the most important th decision uh, more than revenues or distribution strategies for us. Yeah. And Guilherme, you showed me um, some of the things that you use, but perhaps you could describe a few of the, of the, the dilemmas that you experience in this, in this area. Um, yes, well, well first, we, we work with many uh, platforms on the, in the app world. So uh, the first one is the mobile fragmentation. That's a dilemma when we work with iOS and then we work with Android and then there's Windows, and then there's Firefox OS, and then there's, uh, it never ends. But um, you have to be always um, watching what, it, what it's happening on, on the real world, right? So sometimes you have to try to, to do some kind of experiments to, to put out some new technologies, but not every, uh, not all of them will survive. So you have to pay attention on which ones are, are working better, which ones you feel better that, you, that you're working better. Sometimes uh, one platform is good in one country and it's not good in another one, so you have to pay attention on, on, on your results. And that's where the analytics com comes, that, that I told you. That's a new, whole new discipline that, that we had to learn with, with applications. Because once we have our, our application out, it's, it's available to the whole world, so you have to to, to see all the numbers that you have in all countries. And we have multiple languages also selling in multiple countries. So for example, in the United States, we sell clips in Spanish and in English also. So you have to see the results of both of all, all languages you have in all territories. So things that, uh, that, that we, we, we decide today are mostly like 99% based on analytics, right? So there's not much, uh, the dilemma is on what to experiment, but the decisions are much based on, mm -hmm. on analytics. And how do, you, how do you deal, because there's a lot of in-app purchase in your, in your apps, and how do you deal with that, um, that, that uh, issue of kids, kids being able to buy things in apps? And, uh, okay, the first one, we, we didn't deal with that. Apple did that for us. <laughs> so we have the parental control. I think most of you know today, so uh, on some, uh, if you want to be on the kids category also in, in Apple, uh, all your applications need to have the parental control. Everything that it's done to purchase or to go out of the application, to go to the website or something, you have to do like a, a trivia, right? You have to answer some question, which is uh, supposed to be an adult to answer, but sometimes it's easier <laughs> for the children to answer also. But uh, So they have to go through that obstacle to, to buy something. And uh, so these are decisions that are being uh, watched by the developers and also the platforms to avoid, for example, transaction canceling, right? B because pretty much this came from transaction canceling. The, the parents go into Apple again, oh, I want to cancel this whole bunch of, because I did not do it, right? So there are ways that they are doing today to, to make sure. And for example, the password of Google and, and Apple in the beginning, when you purchase something, it would last some, for some days. And today you can choose to, to last only for 50 minutes or even not for 50 minutes. Every time that you purchase something, you have to put your password. So it's your choice to block that also. Okay, thank you. Paul, presumably you wrestle with this as well. I agree. Yeah, no, we, uh, yeah, I mean, of course we do. Um, I, I think we, um, we would still uh, wrestle with the safety of image that you guys have purely because we're in the mobile space and have been there all the time. And we've used advertising as a method. There's no escaping that. From our perspective, we, uh, we defer a certain amount of responsibility to the platform. Of course we do, uh, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that take the bank details from, from the user. We, from our side, what we've, what we've tried to do is obviously within our own apps, they're all copper compliant and we fulfill the highest standards for that. Um, we try and regulate the advertising world uh, in mobile as best we can, which is impossible because it's uh, like a huge, vast network of plumbing where no one has any responsibility at all. But as far as we can control it, uh, we only deal with the biggest partners, the Googles, the big tech guys. So it's, it's something that we've gone as far as we can. Uh, and then outside of that, is the focus is on our content. And in that respect, we know we have a family audience and we would never, we would never um, betray that trust of a parent. So we never would create content which we see as... Uh, as inappropriate for our audience. But having said that, we don't just have a family audience. If you look at our download numbers now, we've ju we're just about to, to pass three billion downloads globally for our apps since launch. Um, that means that that's not just, uh, not just kids, it's not just families, it's everybody. So everyone at some point has picked it up and used the apps. And, and, um, and then that means that we also have to be wary that we are also 
gem dealing with the general public really we can, we we definitely make ourselves safeguard in our content is certainly with with the the end user in mind, which is in often case the secondary user of the device, as you as you kind of allude to. Um, but the main thing for us is just to make sure we're also quite broad and we maintain an edge to it as well. And um, how seriously are you uh, uh, taking or worrying about ad blocking on mobile uh, on mobile devices? Uh, at the moment, not too much, because in app is kind of. A, s a bit of a safe place at the moment because it usually is mobile web and, and as you say it's kind of declining. Um, we'd embrace it if if you're if you're blocking ads uh, the right ads and it, it should make market marketing and the 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 area of marketing innovative um, and and should should think about ways to to get around that in terms of creativity and reaching the audience especially in family and kids. I've always I've always thought it's about creativity of marketing. I've always been. Um, uh, slightly suspect of things like retail and direct to retail in users' hands, and we stray away. We kind of stay away from that stuff. So I, I have no worries there, really. There's a very recent interesting story. I think you've heard that just now they released the iOS 9 with a bunch of ad blockers uh, apps, and the number one, which was selling in the United States, on the first day the guy pulled it out, and he was the leader. He was the first one selling most, and. He just said that he didn't feel right about it. He said that after he did that, he saw that um, he was prejudicing uh, or he was not doing good for many le legitimate, legitimate business that were done before over the advertising. So it was, a, it was an interesting thing that he did and it's a thing that make, makes us think about advertising and how should we act on it. If ad blockers do their job very well and they become very mainstream, then it's going to lead to a subscription strategy for every business that creates content and that's, that'd be great. <laughs> I think mo <laughs> most, most businesses that spend a lot of money on really good content would want users to directly pay for it. Um, and advertising is is the alternative to that at the moment, and it allows it allows uh, kind of the the free transaction of, of money to the people that create the content and have it surfaced and have it raised to the top. Can I ask you finally before we uh, will um, have some questions? But can I ask you finally to do a bit of future gazing? That um, uh, and and. Uh, I realise how difficult this is, but and, and, uh, but have a think about. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about things that you're hoping for, or working on, or would like to see um, uh, coming up on the on the horizon in the sort of next two to five years on your on the digital side. Uh, are there things that you uh, that you're planning that you can talk about that uh, that you hope will come to fruition? Well, I think we're starting to see that now. Uh, this is our busiest year ever. Um, you know, we have three new series launching next year. We have seven series on the air now, so we'll have ten preschool shows on next year. Um, that's because of all of this digital development. Um, the TV networks that we deal with globally um, are just getting more powerful because they're reaching kids 24-7. Um, the digital platforms like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu uh, and, and YouTube are getting more powerful by the day. They've become new clients of ours in the next couple of years to make content. We're making content for all of them. So it's just, uh, it's just an absolutely amazing time. Um, and then when you look at the uh, advent of OTTs um, and the ability to have our content in every home in the world uh, distributed uh, by us, uh, that's just icing on the cake. So we are really busy and really excited, um, and I think the future is incredibly bright. Yeah. Yes, uh, we saw that the, this business model that we started, uh, it's, it's doing great, and we want to continue that. Uh, we're going with more international content now. As you saw, uh, we want to, to go a little bit more into the entertainment, also not just educational, not just having entertainment, but mixing more uh, uh, educational content. That's why we went for the Oxford uh, content also, because we think that it's a perfect uh, fit, it's a perfect mix having entertainment on, on applications. So, and international brands. So we have new, new uh, very well-known brands that are coming from digital also that we'll be working on, on the next months and next year. Uh, with this model of a transactional selling content uh, through applications. Okay, and Paul? Uh, really uh, the opposite for us. So we're, the stuff that we have in the future, um, in, in the immediate future, is, is stuff which is traditional and linear distribution because that's the stuff we haven't done as, as, as much as we have uh, the digital. So I suppose uh, it's the opposite to, them, to most and we're looking into the future of windowing strategies and, and going along the more, line, more the lines of growing our brand into audiences that we haven't reached so far with, with the digital places that we've been. Uh, and on a personal note, VR, obviously. I've been demoed it and it's amazing, so I can't wait for them to come up some way for me to use that in my personal life. Great. 
Um, questions? Would um, yes, hello. Could, I think there's a microphone. Um, there might be a microphone. Yes, there is a microphone. Thank you. Hi there. Good morning. My name is Fanny Aubert Mallory. I'm with the F Institut Francais in Paris. Thanks for this absolutely amazing presentation. My question is about um, languages. We are all here in Cannes and speaking English, and you guys from everywhere uh, speaking English and other languages. Maybe, Guillermo, you mentioned um, different languages. Could you develop a little bit on apps or what you do to reach um, not a public in one language, but audiences in several languages? Thank you. Actually, the, the app environment or uh, the app business, it's perfect for that. Because when you, you release an application, it's already, um, you can be everywhere in, in, in all countries. But of course, you have to think about what you have in the content, right, in, inside of your application. So there are two, two things that you have to think about languages in your application. One is the interface, and the other one is the content, which sometimes they cannot they, they don't go together. Sometimes you can be on, on your device in, in English um, and see all the interface in English, but then you can choose the content in French or you can choose the content in Portuguese or Spanish, right? So what we try to do is to give the uh, most options that, that, that we, we can to the users so they can choose the, the, the language they want. Uh, of course, we always offer first the languages that are based on their home, uh, on their home country, right? Um, and then uh, we have to do the translation uh, if we want to, good, want to have good performance in specific countries, then you have to do the translation of the interface and also have content in that language. How, how many languages do you translate your um, apps into? Um, uh, today we have mostly Portuguese, Spanish, uh, English, and we now have something even in Japanese. Yeah. And we, now with, with Lottie Dottie on the next months, we should go for more than, than five, six languages yeah. also. All right. Our television series uh, literally um, are produced uh, or dubbed in dozens of languages. Um, and uh, it's expensive, um, but it becomes an asset that you can reuse across the digital landscape. Um, the series Word Party that we're making for uh, Netflix has, um, is being made in 18 languages. Um, so it's, it's a very important uh, part of our business, and it's a very expensive uh, proposition. Um, one of the newer developments is YouTube has a, uh, a project to tr um, have crowdsource uh, uh, translation for, for videos. So I think that's something that in the future you should uh, look at as something that could uh, rock the world a bit. Paul, we've, we've run out of time, but, yeah. uh, but the multilingual... Uh, yeah, I, I think there's two sides. It, for us, uh, content is, is really refreshing in this respect because it's relatively easy to do translation. If, I think apps are very easy to translate on the surface, but the difficulty, actually the difficulty with apps in general is that apps no longer are about making an app and releasing it. It's about maintenance, updating, making it always current, keeping it top of mind with users, and that's where the real expense is. It's almost the same expense as creating the app on a, on a yearly basis or, or a six-monthly basis. And that's where translation become, it can become expensive because if you have lots of detail in there and you're constantly updating it into 12 languages, you've just almost times 12 the amount of work that you're doing. Content is much, much better for us. So you have all the auto subtitling, all those kind of features that platforms give you. But you can also do things like we've launched uh, Russian, um, Brazilian neutrals, uh, so Portuguese, neutral Spanish, um, and obviously Mandarin uh, YouTube channels fairly quickly by just uh, having someone come in with a content expertise to, to kind of dub the, the stuff that we already have. So, and it takes us half an hour to create a YouTube channel and to cross promote it so that users get that channel and that content is very, very quick as well. So we're quite flexible there. Fantastic. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but um, thank you very much to our panelists and thank you very much for coming to this session. Thank you.